Hi, thank you, Lance, and uh, thank you, Sam. And we'll get started with this webinar. Today, uh, what we're going to learn about is how private optical networks can benefit uh, your enterprise. Uh, this is something which you might have today, uh, something you might want to upgrade to. We'll see if it's suitable for you and how we at Ribbon can help you uh, build private optical networks if you want to go in that particular direction. So uh, as Lance mentioned, my name is Jonathan Home. I'm Senior Director of Portfolio Marketing, and I'll be joined today uh, by Sam Lyle, who's Business Development Director for North America. We did have a separate session uh, earlier in the day, uh, European time, where I was joined by Mr. Gilad Preminger, which is why he appears on the screen. I'll do most of the talking. Sam will chime in as he uh, decides to do, and also he'll be uh, sitting there on the button to answer questions in real time. So I, I like to start with the screen because to me it's really a metaphor uh, for everything that's changed in our world. If you think just going back a few years ago, uh, how did we uh, handle computing? How did we handle data within our businesses? Well, you had these computer rooms in the basement and everything was handled internally uh, by the IT departments. Today, uh, the bulk of the applications, the bulk of the data has all were moved somewhere into a data center, which is uh, most of the time remote from where the people that are running the businesses take place. And this kind of scenario has really changed uh, the way that business communications uh, is taking place. Uh, it's created a much greater intensity in terms of the communications. Uh, and the fact that communications has become so inexpensive has also, uh, in, in a way, allowed this to happen as well. So the fact that we've been able to uh, build these uh, sort of cloud-based economics based on data centers and uh, based on communications has uh, really fundamentally changed uh, the whole way economies are running and including the way your particular uh, business as an enterprise is running as well. So. What that means is uh, because there's a much greater emphasis on communications, uh, it might be impact the way that you want to handle these communications. So I think the first question to ask, is this webinar for you? Is this something which uh, you think will uh, be able to help you in terms of your business? And I've sort of asked uh, three qualifying questions over here. And so long as you can answer yes to two of them, it probably means a yes. So first of all, are you truly an enterprise? Are, are you a company that's a large business or you know, that has, say, for example, more than 500 employees? Uh, because if not, usually it's not the case where your communications uh, would be intense enough to have a private optical network. You can fulfill your requirements by other means. Uh, the next question is communications among your business locations really critical to your operations? In other words, your employees communicating with applications that are in data centers or communicating with each other. Uh, is this something which needs to take place all the time, needs to be up all the time? Um, again, it is something which is a pertinent question if it makes sense. Also, for instance, you might be a like a utility and you have distributed network with lots of uh, survey, you know, uh, uh, SCADA devices, uh, such as for uh, monitoring and data acquisition, in which case also you need to have a network which is up uh, sort of 100% of the time, 100% reliable and 100% secure. That would fall in this communication among business locations critical to your operations. The other category is having to do with data and how you handle data in your business. Uh, yes, most of the time it's located in data centers, uh, but are you really uh, on top of uh, maintaining uh, continuous backups uh, for that data where you're actually mirroring it among multiple locations uh, in real time? Again, that would be another qualifying question if this uh, webinar makes sense for you. And we'll get into some of these aspects as we proceed. Uh, what you see at the bottom is some of the sectors of enterprises that we at Ribbon sell to for private optical networks. So if you can see yourself reflected among those categories, that's a really another good indication. So before we proceed, just a few words about Ribbon. Uh, you may know the uh, company Ribbon as a unified uh, communications or converged communications provider focusing on applications such as uh, session border controls for voice. Uh, what you may not know is that earlier this year, Ribbon acquired ECI Telecom. 
which is a company selling optical and packet transport solutions worldwide. We sell to service providers as well as to critical infrastructure and to enterprises. And as a combined company, uh, we're serving our customer base with a much broader set of solutions, obviously, you know, covering both the applications layer as well now as the networking layer as well with the ECI uh, added to the portfolio. Uh, and today we'll be focusing on one of the kinds of solutions that ECI or the former ECI brings to the market in terms of optical networking solutions. Uh, we have over 18,000 optical elements deployed worldwide. Uh, Ribbon with ECI is truly a global company. Uh, we're selling it all around the world. So wherever you're tuning in from, I would say with uh, close to 100% certainty, we are able uh, to serve you and your needs. So what are the enterprise connectivity use cases? Uh, and again, we're stepping back a little bit here about how we're fulfilling these use cases, but we're focusing on what are the use cases themselves. So the first one is, I would call it cloud connectivity. And this is where workers are connecting to applications in data centers, somewhere in the cloud. Uh, there's often a need for high bandwidth, not necessarily ultra high bandwidth. And depending on what the application is, just having sort of normal latency that you might experience over the internet to very low latency is uh, usually required. And of course, you want high availability, just sort of you know running almost all the time, but if it goes down occasionally here and there for a few minutes, well, that's acceptable. Uh, then there's office connectivity. This is where workers are connecting with each other. Over here, you're thinking more about maybe uh, video communications or people doing joint design together. And again, this is sort of similar with cloud connectivity in terms of you need sort of the uh, normal level of expectations in terms of bandwidth, latencies, and availability. Uh, then we move into the world of critical connectivity. Uh, this is sort of a cross between applications communicating with each other, uh, maybe IoT, maybe in terms of supervisory control and data acquisition that you would see in utilities, uh, financial, uh, where people need to have almost instantaneous returns in terms of transactions, or in terms of health, uh, maybe moving in the future towards things such as remote surgery. Here the bandwidth I'm saying is medium uh, because most of the time the emphasis, except maybe for remote surgery, where you want to have really a very, very high image, uh, but that's a bit more of a future application. Most of the time here in the critical connectivity, you don't need to have very high bandwidth. But what you do need to have is very low delay. And because it's critical connectivity, you need to have very, very high availability. And then finally, there's data replication. Uh, this is where you want real-time mirroring of what's called synchronous data replication uh, between uh, your data centers that you have 100% guarantee uh, that your data is protected in terms of disasters. Uh, so this is the sort of gamut of kind of communications that you'll face in your enterprise. Now, how does the, the, these get fulfilled? Before we talk about how they're fulfilled, though, I just want to spend another minute on the data replication side. So data replication is important for disaster recovery. Uh, obviously, if you're in an enterprise, you're either responsible for or you're working with people that are responsible for business continuity. Uh, this means that if some part of your operation is affected, you have an ability to recover as quickly as possible. There's actually an economic price tag uh, that you can put on uh, disaster recovery. Uh, I've linked to a particular article that I found that was very interesting. And if you're a large business or an enterprise, it can cost as much as $700,000 an hour. So if you're out of operation, which means say you don't have access to the data on which your business is running on for a couple of hours, well, there you're going over a million dollars right away. So it's worthwhile investing in uh, data recovery. So what are the elements that go into the data side in terms of how your data is backed up and then how you recover from data failures? So this sort of shows two modes of operation over here in terms of um, what you would call backup and recovery and then the disaster recovery and business continuity. And it's looking at it from the point of view of if your data is lost, how long does it take you to recover the data and then um, what is your recovery time objective from that? So obviously, if you're doing things, say, backing data up to a tape, which probably people don't do anymore, um, or you're just putting it onto a disk, it's um, 
and that disk is in a remote site, then you probably would uh, lose you know, several hours to, at the worst, several minutes of data. So when I say several minutes of data, that's what's called asynchronous uh, data replication, which is probably the most common mode used today outside of synchronous. So how does asynchronous work? So you have a transaction that goes to a data center, you write it to your disk drives in that particular data center, then there's another process which has nothing to do with that particular transaction that at, that at its leisure, perhaps several minutes later, will take that data and write it to another uh, data center, you know, which could be located several tens of miles away, uh, and this way that you know your data is backed up. However, if something happens to that first data center, you know, even to the machine or to the data center as a whole, then all that time that the data has not been backed up because it was waiting for the application to do so, you will have lost that data. Synchronous replication, and I'll show you that on the next slide, means that you don't commit the data to the first transaction until it's actually backed up in the other data center. And what that means is, uh, from a recovery point of view, you really lost no data whatsoever, and you can recover your business almost instantaneously. So for companies uh, that are heavily reliant on uh, data as part of their business, they're moving more and more towards synchronous data replication. And another reason for doing that is because it's becoming much more economically viable to do it. So here's an illustration of what synchronous re data replication means. Uh, say you have a transaction taking place, number one, you actually write that to the data center, but it's actually not uh, the transaction doesn't come back as confirmed as written because what it needs to do next is actually first update the uh, primary uh, database in that first data center, then it sends it to the next data center, it waits for the confirmation from the second data center, and then it sends it back as transaction confirmed. So what this means from a synchronous point of view, once your transaction is confirmed, you've actually written exactly the same set of data to two separate uh, data centers. Now usually these data centers are, lo are located either tens or you know miles apart so that if a disaster happens for whatever reason uh, in one location it is far enough geographically removed from the other location that your data is protected and that you can have business continuity. What are the requirements for data replications? Well you need high bandwidth because you can have a lot of data. You need to have about five milliseconds not necessarily of link latency uh, but I th think you need to have the transactions committed themselves within about five milliseconds, which means you'd have to even have lower link latency available. Uh, you need extremely high availability, and you need to be able to support multiple kinds of clients that are used in storage mechanisms. So this could be either gigabit Ethernet, or it could be fiber channel. And uh, this kind of application, and we have a number of customers that are doing this, it's really ideally suited to optical links because they're fast, they have uh, virtually no latency, just uh, determined by the speed of light, and uh, you can provide multiple mechanisms for providing backup. As I'm showing over here, you can have a protection link, so if one link goes down, you have another way of uh, being able to uh, mirror the uh, transactions in multiple databases. So now coming back and looking at the big picture, of uh, enterprise connectivity options. So I outlined a number of scenarios in terms of the kinds of connectivity uh, that take place in uh, enterprises. And again, these could be people to the cloud, people with people having a, uh, a critical communication needs and data replication needs. Now, everything starts off uh, in terms of some type of data. So I'm illustrating that through a router over here. Now, the usual way routers connect with each other would be through a packet network. Now, underlying that packet network might be an optical network, but again, you would actually having the data transit through the routers. And this is the way most of the world's communications takes place. Uh, it's excellent for moderate bandwidth and latency. We're going over packet networks as we're running this webinar. Uh, and it's the least expensive because the whole model of packet networking is based on statistical multiplexing. However, it does require a packet layer engineering, and if you're trying to run high bandwidth, low latency, high availability applications over there, you can suffer as a result of the packet layer. So within an enterprise, a very, very viable option for handling this kind of traffic, again, coming off the router, is to bypass the packet layer altogether 
and just provide what I called a nailed up connection going directly through an optical network. I'm showing this here going through several nodes, uh, but it could just be a point-to-point -point connection itself between the routers, particularly if you're trying to connect two data centers, say, 30, 40 miles apart. Uh, that's something which is bread and butter for optical networks to do every day. So this is really best for high bandwidth communications where you're running, uh, say, one or 10 gigabit Ethernet links, uh, low latency links. It's totally transparent connectivity. Once you put the optical link there, you're just plugging in the physical interfaces and what the optical network does is it takes one physical interface, maps it onto the link, and then spits it out the other side where it gets translated down to what, whatever uh, that particular uh, packet mechanism was, say whether it was gigabit ethernet or fiber channel. Um, and you might think it's more expensive to do it through an optical network, but really, once you start taking a look at the overall kind of bandwidth that you need and the performance requirements you need, if you try to do this over a packet layer, uh, you'll find that actually it is more economical uh, to do it directly optically. So for people that are on this call that may not be familiar uh, with how optical networks works, uh, I'll put this up as a sort of a two-minute tutorial slide. Uh, this is showing a point-to-point -point link. Uh, there's various ways to build optical networks, but I've just sort of done the most simple link over here. So at the left-hand side, what you see are the kinds of enterprise services that you want to transport. So I'm showing Ethernet all the way from one gigabit Ethernet to the latest and greatest kinds of speeds coming off of routers, which are 400 gigabit, gigabit Ethernet. I'm storing storage networking, uh, which today the most popular uh, interface for that outside of Ethernet is Fiber Channel, and this runs from speeds from Fiber Channel 1 to 32. Uh, if you're an enterprise, you may still want to carry, uh, particular for locations talking to each other, um, uh, TDM traffic, and this could be SDH or Sonnet traffic, uh, again, based on circuits that you have in place, and you just want to be able to carry them yourselves rather than going through a service provider. And again, there's more and more emphasis these days on video signals, particularly for video streaming, video monitoring. So what you do is you use in an optical network devices called transponders or muxponders. And what they do is they terminate the physical side of that interface, and then they map the bit streams coming from that interface onto a wavelength. A transponder maps a single service onto a single wavelength. A muxponder takes multiple services and maps it onto a single wavelength. And that's primarily the mode that you would use in an enterprise network, because probably you have multiple lower speed services, such as one gigabit Ethernet or even 10 gigabit Ethernet, may sound fast for you, but for an optical network, it's slow. So if you have multiple lower speed services like that, what you do is you map it onto a wavelength, which today would be transported, say, at 100 gigabits per second or even 200 gigabits per second. Uh, it could even go much higher than that, but those are usually the speeds that are required within enterprises. They go down the optical fiber, and then they're translated back to their native protocols at the other end. So what you're doing over here is you're nailing up the transport service without the headaches of packet layer engineering. So how can you achieve, uh, I need to turn the light on in my room because it got turned off. Well, this is the, uh, that's the fun of uh, Zoom <laughs> and webinars and everything in, in the age of COVID. No problem, Jonathan, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, we just went blank there for a second. So there's three ways to achieve uh, layer one connectivity for your enterprise. You can go to a service provider and uh, lease a dedicated uh, internet circuit. Uh, they're, they're all called dedicated internet, dedicated ethernet, or you can even get a wavelength service directly from a service provider. But you're paying a fair bit of money for that. Um, or you could actually build a private optical network and do it yourself. And that's what we're focusing on in today's uh, webinar. Or what you can do is do a hybrid of both. Depending on uh, where you're running your uh, network, you can have, for instance, some of this built yourself or some of this you could lease uh, from the service provider, maybe doing that as a backup facility in case uh, there's problems uh, with one or the other. Um, most of the time, though, people that are building a private optical network will just use their optical network themselves. So what are the uh, benefits of uh, building a private optical network? 
Uh, I'll, I'll just run through these and you could read them yourselves as I'm going through them. The first and probably foremost is it's cheaper. Uh, payback is usually 18 to 30 months. 30 months is very, very much the ceiling. Usually it's done within a uh, couple of years when compared against lease solutions. So the answer is yes, you can do a lease solution, uh, but if you want to save money, uh, then this is, uh, there is a, a fast payback on these kinds of solutions for doing it. Another one is unlimited bandwidth. You can have all your communications needs on a single network, both for data networking, both for connectivity among locations, uh, and also for getting the best connectivity to the internet itself for the traffic that you want to go over the internet. Uh, you guarantee the lowest latency. Uh, it's much faster than running this over a packet network. Again, you're really just bound by the speed of light which is, I was discussing this with Sam before the call, is uh, five uh, microseconds per uh, kilometer, I think you said, uh, was it, uh, Sam? Yes, yeah. that's good. Yeah, yep. thanks. It's extremely reliable uh, because you can design in as much redundancy as you need to achieve any target uptime, if, particularly if you're having various locations on a ring, you can have bi-directional traffic, that if uh, the fiber, say, gets broken in one direction, you can go around the ring in the other direction. It's easy to operate. You operate it yourself. Uh, all these optical networks have a single pane of glass for provisioning, for moves and changes. You don't have to wait for the service provider if you need to make changes to your network. They're highly secure because you don't have any exposure to the service provider facilities, which are more viewed by the public and maybe even open to threats from people that want to cause harm. And on top of that, you can uh, encrypt your optical traffic. And then finally, above all, it's control. There's no dependence on third parties. Uh, for the critical infrastructure underlying your business. So again, people that do this really look at a whole number of these benefits all coming together. And maybe I'll just chime in here uh, briefly if I can, Jonathan, with some experience from the U.S. Uh, I, I would say that most of the folks that we're working with on these types of solutions, you know, money cost savings was part of the equation, but it wasn't really the fundamental driver. I think the fundamental driver for most end user enterprises was things like high reliability, security, and, and the ability to control their own destiny and kind of manage their own traffic over a wide area. Those are, those are things that really matter most to folks making this kind of decision in our experience. Thanks, Sam. So how do you go about building an optical network? Uh, so there's really three uh, elements towards doing that. Uh, the first is dark fiber. You need fiber. Uh, the good news is there's lots and lots of dark fiber out there. Companies are laying fiber for all sorts of reasons, uh, both for resale to enterprises, for resale to service providers, or even service providers themselves usually have a lot of extra fiber that they've laid for their own needs that they're willing to resell to other companies. And this could be to other service providers, say because they're acting a bit as a carrier or carrier there, or selling it directly to enterprises. You can go on the web and there's a multiple uh, websites that are really pointing you to how to obtain a dark fiber in your particular region. Then you need the optical networking gear. I've shown you uh, some of the gear that we have here. Uh, these are really just uh, the kind of things that look like routers, if you like, in terms of you put them into your 19-inch racks. Uh, they terminate the fiber, and they're on one side, they terminate your equipment coming off routers, your storage devices on the other side, and lo and behold, you now have an optical network. And then finally, there's the system integrator. You may not want to put this all together, but you're probably working with some system integrator today uh, for some of your IT needs, some of your communications need. Uh, most of these companies are very familiar with how to put optical networks together. And again, I'd like to sort of point out over here that service providers, the uh, one part of any of these large service providers today can provide you a leased solution for an optical network, but most large service providers also have a division that act as system integrators. They're not the same sets of people, uh, and they will uh, work with you as a third-party system integrator, helping you put your own private optical network together. They could also provide services such as for monitoring your optical network if you don't want to do that. 
So I'm going to go through in this uh, next part of the presentation a little bit about some of the major elements uh, that you're looking for in terms of how you would assemble an optical network and uh, what are some of the things that we can provide at Ribbon. So what I have over here on the left-hand side, it shows our Apollo uh, optical networking system. Uh, this is the entire product line that you're seeing in this particular diagram and you, you see there are a lot of big iron type of stuff and the reason you see that is because the big iron stuff is really oriented towards large carrier grade service provider solutions uh, with a lot of advanced capabilities for optical routing, optical switching uh, and carrying the, really the uh, highest levels of interfaces. The good news is that there are subsets of this equipment that are very much oriented towards uh, lower end from an optical networking point of view applications, uh, which includes making it economically feasible for enterprises. And this is the sort of key points uh, why we think Apollo can provide you an outstanding solution. It's economical and again, uh, modular, compact, low power, payback for itself, like I said, in about two years. Uh, at the same time, it provides all the performance you need, but if you're in an application where you need more, well, then you can just upgrade to some of what you would call these sort of the service provider level capabilities, and I'll give you some examples of that later. And then finally, it's manageable. You, you have complete life cycle uh, management uh, for all moves and changes, all monitoring, including both the optical performance and the fiber monitoring through a single pane of glass. The uptake on this slide, and I'm not going to go through it, is there's really two classes of solutions uh, that uh, enterprises need, and then within that there's various ways they can be fulfilled. I've underlined the uh, term here in the headline, multi-service layer one optical networks. So in some cases, you're not going to be transporting just gigabit Ethernet clients, which you want, say, for IT traffic or some storage solutions, but you're going to want to transport other traffic as well, such as for fiber channel, your sodded SDH solutions, and it may be OTU traffic itself as well. In this particular case, uh, there's two ways that we can fulfill this with Apollo, both what's, what's called OTN transport and OTN switching, and I'm not going to go into the fine details of what the differences are between these right now. I'll highlight some of them, um, but it's something if you want to follow up on, we can go into much more detail afterwards. So this highlights the uh, OTN uh, transport solution. So if you go back a few slides and you think about the MUX bundle that I talked about where it terminates many different kinds of service interfaces and maps them all into a common wavelength, well that's what's accomplished on this card over here. So you can see uh, that it uh, is able to map on all the different types of gigabit Ethernet traffic, all the different types of fiber channel traffic, as well as various uh, SONET and SDH traffic. And what it does is it takes all this traffic and maps it onto a single 200 gigabit per second uh, link, which can actually go up to 1,200 kilometers. On top of that, it's able to provide per-service encryption. So this provides an extremely economical way to take multiple client interfaces and put them onto a single fiber. Not only a single fiber, but a single channel on that single fiber. The OTN switching equivalent of that solution is shown over here, and this is a new product which uh, we actually we just formally announced yesterday, if you take a look at uh, PR uh, fees that are coming out with. Uh, this is something which we're starting to ship to our customers at the end of the year. It's available for trials right now. If you have a ring configuration, and what you want to be able to do is add and drop different types of traffic to different points on this ring, say between, say, say, you, say you're an enterprise and you have a corporate location in a city, you have a manufacturing site a few kilometers away, another manufacturing site a few kilometers away from that, then you have a data center a few kilometers away from that, then you, what you can do is network all the traffic on a ring, and rather than engineer point-to-point -point connections, which is what a MUX ponder does, what you can do now is because this has an embedded switching matrix, you can still terminate all your client traffic, but what you do is you can very flexibly just add and drop this traffic onto different places all on the ring, again, through a number of points and clicks uh, through your uh, network and through your control interface. So uh, this is really becoming a new paradigm for building private optical networks. Uh, this kind of solution was not economically feasible 
for, pro for enterprises uh, a few years ago, but we've been able to reduce the cost of these kinds of solutions where it now becomes uh, directly equivalent uh, with a lot of the multiplexer solutions that are out there and is extremely attractive if you have this kind of network configuration. I mentioned uh, optical encryption and we support optical encryption on all our solutions. Uh, what optical encryption does is it protects the fiber optic network from snooping. What I mean by snooping is it's not so difficult to just uh, splice onto a fiber if you can find some place where it's exposed. And again, this is the case, by the way, it doesn't matter if it's a private optical network or a service provider network or anyone's network. If you have access to the fiber, what you can do is you can tap into the fiber, you extract some of the light for the, from the fiber, and then as long as you uh, can uh, basically demultiplex that traffic, what you have is access to all the information on that particular fiber. And because fiber optic networks span so much distances, uh, they're actually a highly exposed part of your network. The question that we get asked, and it's a totally legitimate question, well, aren't the higher levels on top of the actual fiber transmission already encrypted, such as using MACSEC or IPSEC or at the application layer? So the answer is yes, they are most of the time, but not all the time. And then on top of that, you never have the addressing information at the packet layer encrypted because that is needed for the actual data links to work. So by tapping into the optical fiber, what you're able to do is obtain access to all the MAC layer addressing as, all to, as well as the traffic flows themselves. And if you're a serious hacker and you're trying to break into an enterprise, just getting access to that information actually helps you uh, break into higher levels of the network. So by being able to provide fiber optic encryption, which is really a very marginal incremental cost, you're just providing another layer of security for your network, particularly for your critical information. Uh, this is an overview of the solution that we have with Apollo. Uh, the main points to highlight is that it uses A AES 256 encoding, which is the highest level of encoding that's available, so it's unbreakable. Uh, and we, we allow the uh, enterprise itself, of course, to administer the keys uh, as part of the uh, public key exchange mechanisms on which all modern-day encryption is based. Uh, this is important because this is something that you want to be able to manage in-house, and uh, this way you have total uh, confidence in terms of being able to distribute the keys uh, to the um, various nodes that are on the optical network. This is based on a public and private key type of uh, exchange, and the private keys never, ever uh, leave the Apollo uh, nodes themselves. Uh, they're, they're just sort of firmly embedded with them, so they don't, they don't move and they cannot be stolen from there. Also provides uh, what's called X509 node authentication, that the nodes are, uh, are who they say they are, which presents, pre prevents man-in-the-middle attacks. The uh, sort of thing that I want to highlight on this slide, which is really interesting, and this is a whole presentation in, the, uh, in and of itself, the way that encryption is attacked today is not by trying to decrypt the link, but by trying to hack the uh, key encryption mechanisms. And, and again, today, they're unhackable based on standard computing. However, a new generation of quantum computing is coming about where it's been shown that using the kind of technology that's perhaps available at a military grade today or just sort of research level grade today will be available in a commercial grade several years from now and they can use these quantum computing approaches to actually hack current public key exchange mechanisms. So as a result of that a new uh, suite of key exchange mechanisms uh, are being developed that are unhackable from a quantum computing point of view uh, we already have these available today uh, that we can actually demonstrate them to you. Uh, they're available for trial purposes and again just gives you the confidence that uh, if you use a solution uh, based on Apollo uh, that you'll be, uh, be protected not just from uh, hacks that are you know unpenetrable today but also hacks that will be unpenetrable in the future using quantum computing. The next level 
of uh, solution that I wanted to talk about quickly was gigabit ethernet only. In some cases, you do not have a multi-service network. What you're relying upon is just gigabit ethernet, which of course is becoming the most popular type of packet clients uh, that are being used today uh, within most of the world. In this particular case, we have two sets of solutions. Uh, one is which is performance optimized and one is power density optimized. So rather than talk about them here, let me just uh, explain them over here. So this is the uh, performance optimized solution. So what's happening in the optical transmission world is we're running up against the uh, physical limits of how much information you can put down through a fiber. This is something called the Shannon limit. Uh, what this means is that you can't the technology does not allow any further going both faster and further at the same time. There's a trade-off that uh, if you have a particular distance based on the inherent noise level within the fiber, you can only go up to a certain amount of speed on that particular fiber. But being able to obtain that speed means you need a lot of knobs to extract uh, that maximum speed, which means you need to be able to choose your modulation scheme, you need to choose your baud rate, you need to choose, choose your channel bandwidth. And when you really need the maximum performance, uh, this is the kind of solution that we have at Ribbon based on our Apollo product line that enables you to do that in terms of being able to program the transmission to tune the knobs to get that, to get that transmission. There's a few approaches for doing this in the industry today. Um, if you're following some of the announcements, you've probably seen some announcements about what's called an 800G technology. Uh, we have at Ribbon something called the dual 600G technology, which has not gotten quite the headlines, but when you take a look beyond the headlines themselves, it's not really a, about the whether it's 600G or 800G. What's important is how many clients you can transport over what kinds of conditions. And I've taken here as an example the amount of 400 gigabit Ethernet clients that you can transfer. So one of the things that we can do with our technology that our competitors cannot, first of all, is deploy this over what's called brownfield environments, where you have existing infrastructure and you've already deployed multiplexers, which limits this to 50 gigahertz wide or 100 gigahertz wide channels. They can't do that. They need a greenfield. Uh, we can actually transport, as you can see, 400 gigabit Ethernet 1,000 kilometers or uh, two 400 gigabit Ethernet with those same cards 200 kilometers. When you compare this on a greenfield environment as opposed to the brownfield, um, depending on the channel width, uh, we're probably as twice as good uh, than the competition. Uh, we, when it comes to multiple transport of 400 gigabit Ethernet, again, they have no capability. And when we're sort of optimized to their kind of channel conditions, well, it's roughly the same. So I think, you know, if you've sort of been looking at the headlines and you think you're persuaded by things like 800G, I'm saying look at it deeper. Don't look at the headlines. Take a look at what the technology can do for you. But that's the performance optimized. In most cases, most of your needs can actually get fulfilled by what's called the power and density optimized, which is also the lowest cost solution for gigabit Ethernet tra transport. Here we have an extremely dense card. What you're seeing over here in the upper right is the card itself. Three of these cards go into a single uh, platform of the Apollo product line. And based on this, what we've shown is for different types of distances, say for 500, just over 500 kilometers, you could use two of these platforms to transport 2,400 gigabit Ethernet clients or six 400 gigabit Ethernet clients. Going up to over 2,000 kilometers, that drops by about half. And then when you're going up to 4,000 kilometers, for this level of the technology, we can't do the 400 gigabit, but we can continue to do the 600, uh, six times 100 gigabit Ethernet traffic. So it's an extremely versatile uh, piece of uh, hardware, and it provides extremely dense, uh, low-cost transport for your gigabit Ethernet traffic. So running an optical network, of course, is about transporting this traffic, but it's more than transporting your traffic. If you're building a private optical network, what you also want is an ability to monitor the performance uh, of, this, uh, of your optical network. In this case, we offer a solution that's called Light Pulse. It's based on embedded monitoring. You don't need to add any hardware to the network. All the hardware is contained themselves in the uh, transmission cards. 
And what it's able to do is provide continuous monitoring of your optical network from end to end. And by doing historical analyses, what you can do is see if there's any degradations that are occurring over time, and you can address these before they become service affecting. Also, if you're running an existing network and you want to transition to a new network, uh, such as an Apollo network, but you need to keep some of your older circuits, we can run your older circuits over our network and all, as alien wavelengths, and not only run them, we can continue to monitor them as well, that you have control over your existing plant as well as any new uh, circuits that you're putting up with Apollo. One other aspect of running a private optical network is also being able to have insights into the fiber uh, underlying your network. So that's different than monitoring the performance of the optical signal. Here what you're concerned about is the integrity of the fiber itself. Um, the fiber is susceptible to breaks uh, based on perhaps uh, some uh, problem occurring totally beyond your control. Uh, and again, from the, from the fiber that you're leasing or maybe even the fiber that you're owning. Uh, and also fiber itself is susceptible to degradations, uh, sometime, degradation sometimes uh, within the splices along the fiber itself. Here we have a capability uh, which is called, uh, based on centralized OTDR. OTDR is like radar for fiber where you send a light pulse down the fiber and you're seeing based on the bounce back what the characteristics of the fiber are. Now, one of the main advantages of our system is that it's in service. In other words, this does not interfere in any way with the traffic that you're running over the fiber. And if there's a problem, uh, you can locate that to within meters and then dispatch a crew or whoever owns your dark fiber, you can direct them where to go as soon as possible to fix the problem. Also, you can do historical monitoring in terms of your OTDR traces. So that if you do see kinds of degradation starting to happen, you can address these become service affecting. Well, I'll run through a couple of use cases here in terms of how our customers are using private optical networks. And I'll go from what I would call the simple to the more complex. So uh, this is a manufacturer in Europe. Uh, this is where they have a number of manufacturing locations and data center locations spread out over a common region. This is the actual topology of their network. And what they're using the uh, optical network for is primarily data replication, uh, that sort of bread and butter application uh, that I talked about at the beginning of the presentation, mainly running this over a fiber channel. Uh, and all the routes are doubled for protection as well. So what you see here is actually times two. So uh, this is a multi-service application running both gigabit ethernet as well as fiber channel clients, uh, where the customer is providing encryption for the fiber channel links and because they want to maintain uh, continuous monitoring of their network, uh, they're also running the Light Pulse application for performance monitoring with the OTDR for actual monitoring of the fiber itself. So why did they go with Ribbon? Because these requirements are reflected in exactly what we're providing them with at a very economical price. Another kind of application, and here I'm moving towards the USA, uh, this is a power cooperative where the utility company is actually providing an infrastructure for uh, 38 co-ops uh, that are actually extending service uh, themselves, uh, not just as power transmission, but also in terms of providing telecommunication services uh, with residential broadband services. And what we're doing over here is providing a backbone for the uh, main utility company, which is now uh, leasing this capacity, uh, they're acting as a utelco to these co-ops. What they needed was an ability to have as much uh, capacity as their uh, customers required. They needed something which was extremely secure and reliable, uh, be able to control it and monitor it themselves, and also be able to grow it as the traffic continues to grow. So again, uh, this is based on the kind of compact solutions uh, that I showed to you and uh, provides encryption as needed, which they again can be resold as a service uh, to the end customers themselves. And they also deploy the OTDR feature and they're extremely happy with that because they've actually come back and said, this is amazing because we've been running some fiber optic uh, services in the past before we moved to the Apollo platform and what we've seen is a huge reduction in the number of trouble tickets. And when there is a problem, we can dispatch people to repair crews directly. 
uh, one of the main problems utilities like this have actually is fiber actually being dug up, backhoes and all the rest of those things. So they need to be able to scramble as quickly as possible. So rather than having to dispatch a team into the field to discover where the fiber problem is located and patch on sort of remote handheld monitoring equipment, they can do this all from the, the uh, comfort of their centralized uh, network operation center. Now growing in sophistication, this is the last use case. Uh, actually, this is an announced customer that we've had. This is the uh, research and education network. So a research and education network is a sophisticated kind of enterprise where they provide connectivity to different institutions all on the network, but all needing to communicate with each other and centralized resources uh, that are being used for research and education within a country. Uh, these kind of institutions uh, or research and education networks occur all over the world. In this particular case, we're uh, putting together a network for over 70 nodes, supporting over 750 institutions, over 11,000 kilometers of fiber. And uh, it's the standard optical networks that are needed. They need high capacity, and they also need reconfigurability. So in this particular case, it's going beyond just providing simple transport and connectivity between locations, but it's also providing an ability to reroute traffic in a very flexible manner. So they're using some of the kinds of capabilities that we would also sell to service providers. Uh, depending on your background, you may be familiar with terms such as RODEMs, reconfigurable optical ad drop multiplexers. Again, uh, these are used throughout these networks that you could flexibly route uh, optical connections uh, in many different types of uh, ways from one node to another across the network. And what this does is it saves a lot of money from putting together multiple point-to-point -point connections because what you can do is you can bring many optical fibers into a particular node and then you could route the wavelengths that are coming in to those optical fibers out on different wavelengths when they're leaving the nodes without having to go through expensive uh, electronic uh, conversion. Uh, the main point to emphasize is here is this company loves us. Uh, we've uh, been supplying them for over seven years right now and we've been able to provide continuous smooth upgrades as new technologies come on board. They started off with a 10G network, we moved them to a 100G network, now they're going to a 200G network and probably be 400G in a few years from now. Uh, all monitored again through centralized management. So with this I'd like to conclude and the messages I'd like to leave you with is if you're considering a private optical network for your business, uh, it's probably much easier than you think uh, to put this together. On top of that, you can control your own destiny and you can save money at the same time. Uh, without going through all those bullet points, uh, we have a solution uh, that's highly customizable and we're pretty sure it can meet any of your needs. And uh, if you're interested, give us a call. So if you have questions in terms of this material, I've put down the address for myself and for Sam. And if you're just interested in sort of just testing the waters and getting a direct quote, say, for a link between two locations, you can bypass us. And I've given you the name of someone on the commercial side that you can contact directly. So at, at this point, Sam, if you'd like to add any sort of closing words or any questions that have come in, uh, now's the time. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, Lance, uh, nicely done, Jonathan. Lance, did we have any questions that uh, popped yeah. in? Yeah, we sure did. There's there's two questions that uh, we, we could get through here. Uh, the first one, uh, where would I physically house the optical gear? And are th is there any special requirements for that? Uh, well, I, I can take that one. It's uh, optical gear, just think about that as something similar to the kind of router gear that you would have or your storage devices. It, it, it's standard types of communications equipment. So wherever you have an equipment room or a communications room, you would just put it there. Um, all the kind of gear that we would sell is just strictly AC powered, uh, doesn't need you know, any special, uh, has its own internal fans, doesn't need any special temperature control. Uh, this is, it's, it's, it's just a straightforward deployment. If you're putting this into a co-location, uh, within a data center, most of these colo centers also have, besides having the sort of the main areas dedicated for uh, the storage, uh, you know, racks of storage devices, they also have what I would call network equipment rooms, and you would probably stick it somewhere in there. Okay, fantastic.
Um, one other one that came through. Uh, what is the latency differences between a VPN service and a private optical network? Mm, I can answer that. Do you want to take that, Sam, or? Yeah, differences between like a like a like a, like packet VPN service and then a private optical network. Yeah, the, the the performance you're going to get out of the optical network is is much larger. You're never going to have a risk of you know packet loss, for example. You're not going to have variations in latency that may be caused by you know, congestion of other people's traffic on the shared network. So you're going to get kind of guaranteed uh, golden performance, and also you get uh, really a much higher level of security. Uh, layer 2, Layer 3 VPNs are, are very, very flexible, uh, but there's a way actually, I don't think we really got into it much today, there's a way to mimic that level of flexibility actually with an optical solution. So we've got customers who are delivering uh, uh, you, you can build, let's put it this way, you can build a point-to-multi-point connectivity solution uh, that largely leverages optical capabilities and, and doesn't really rely on conventional VPNs. So lots of differences, uh, and that's why people uh, tend to like the optical approach. Great. Okay, that's it, Jonathan. Um, okay. Yeah, Thank I, you. If nothing else to add there, uh, Anything else, uh, Sam, before we kind of close out? No, we can give folks back a few minutes. Glad Hi. to have everyone today. Yeah, so just a heads up to everyone on the call. We will be sending out a, an email later this afternoon with a link to the replay of everything you've heard today, uh, along with the slides as well. So um, when you get that, feel free to reply if, if you have any questions. Um, there's, again, that piece of collateral that we have for you. Don't forget to take that. Uh, and, of course, ribboncommunications.com. Uh, plenty of more information on this topic as well as other ways to get a hold of us um, besides the, the contacts you see there on your screen. Again, thank you for your time today. Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks, Sam. And uh, we hope to see you all again on the next webinar shortly down the road. Take care and have a great day. Thank you. Day.